uh, the question asked, if there is no hell, why preach the gospel? How many of you heard that? And that's really a common uh, statement, and I have a very similar, and, and the reason why I wanted, I was originally going to talk about politics, but I decided not to. And, but it might upset you the way I would talk about it. And so instead of me talking about politics, I was going to tell you to get a copy of Clyde Pilkington's book, uh, Politics and Our High Calling of God. So get, get a copy that everything I was going to say will be found in that book. So if, you, if, you're, involved, if you're involved politically, I have it here for you. Uh, get uh, Clyde's book. But anyway, what I want to talk to you about is why preach the gospel if there is no hell? And let me just say, first of all, when you're on the side of truth, you don't have to defend yourself because you're on the side of truth. And those who say that because there's no hell, why preach the gospel is really a shallow statement. Why preach the gospel? The answer is this, and I'm going to say something that might sound strange to you. Do you realize the evangel of the grace of God is not that God is going to save all mankind? That is true, that God is going to save all mankind. But the burden of the Apostle Paul is not what happens at the consummation, but what takes place during the eons. And my answer to those who say, why preach the gospel? Because those without Christ are going to miss out on a whole lot. We are not universalists. We do not teach that everyone right now is already saved. We say they will be at the consummation. Those without Christ today are not justified. They do not have Ionian life. They will not be at the snatching away. They will have no part in the millennium, and they will have no part in the new heavens and new earth. They will have no part of the celestial allotment. So the answer, very simply, why proclaim the evangel? What is the purpose of it? The answer is, the evangel, the grace of God, saves us from a couple of things. One, it saves us from death, from the eons. The teaching of the afterlife or consciousness at death has so screwed up the teaching of the evangel of grace that people don't know how to approach it anymore. How many of you heard the question that Evan and I know there's, I was talking to the gentleman back there about you being a Baptist. Remember the question that they always ask? Where will you go when you die? Did you know that nobody in the Bible ever asked that question? Do you know what the proper question is? The proper question is the question that Job asked. If a man die, shall he live again? Now you're on the right track. Because now you get to, to, to talk about the death, entombment, and resurrection of Christ. So, but the answer very simply, first of all, is why we proclaim the evangel of grace? Because we want to see people rescued from death during the eons. Those who do not believe in Christ have no future during the Eonian times. They will appear before the great white throne judgment to enter into the second death and not to appear again until the consummation, and we don't know how long that will be. We have no clue how long the new heavens and new earth will be. If you want date setting called Harold Camping, he might have an answer for you, but he hasn't been too right so far. So the first answer is we want to save them from death. That's why we, and that's why Paul plays such an emphasis and a burden. That's why you see Paul. Now we are full, and I'm, how many of you believe in the sovereignty of God? Okay. You know, Paul says a lot of things that people have a bad concept of the sovereignty of God. He says a lot of things that if, if Paul were here saying it today, you would probably think he didn't believe in God's sovereignty. Like Paul would say, I do everything in my power to save people. Oh, Paul, only God saves people. He would say, shut up. That's, in there. That's, that's, the, that's the absolute viewpoint. But relatively speaking, God gives us a job to do and to herald the evangel. That is our first and primary uh, uh, job, as it were, as ambassadors of Christ is to herald the evangel. I know people, to be honest with you, have given more money to political campaigns than they ever have to heralding the evangel. And they admit it. They think that their sole goal in life is to pay lower taxes and defend their property. 
They are more interested in real estate than getting out the evangel of the grace of God. They are more interested in shedding blood in other countries than they are getting out the evangel. We as believers, if anything, we have a message of conciliation. We're not interested in war. We're not interested in guns. We're not interested in killing. We're interested in a message that is far better than 1776 or the glorious revolution of 1688 or anything that came out of the Roman Republic. Paul was not impressed with Plato, Aristotle, or the Roman aqueducts. Paul was not impressed with any of the philosophical or, or the uh, technological advancement of his age. You know what he wrote over all of them? Perishing. No God. And so we as believers have a calling. We have an expectation. Our citizenship is in heaven from whence we are eagerly, eagerly expecting our Savior. And so, what is the position? What is our role? Our goal in this life is, well, we can say every one of us, we believe what Paul says. Uh, you know, it's interesting when you take the two great letters of Paul that teach us the main foundational doctrine of Romans and Ephesians. The first 11 chapters of Romans give us the, the, the teaching. And the last part from 12 to 16 tells us what to do with it. Ephesians 1 through 3. How many of you heard the phrase, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing among the celestials in the heavenly places? I mean, right? You, you, you like that phrase? But guess what? He tells you to carry the atmosphere of the celestial into your home in Ephesians 5. We have the, we have the teaching in the first part, and then we have the practice in, in, in the last half. So we are first and foremost, Clyde's got a great statement in his book. We are, we are not Christians first or an American second or Americans first and Christians second. We are believers, period. And the believer in Iraq who embraces Paul's message, we have a closer relationship to them than we do any of the political leaders in our country. And so we are not a national organization. We have nothing to do with nationalism. We don't salute flags. We salute one person. We salute our Savior. I know I'm kind of going all over the place. But I, you know, when I get into to, to these meetings, and I don't know the people, I, I the only people I know are the people I came with, and except these two gentlemen right here, is I like to get to know you first before I just talk. And so I'm, I was kind of. Uh, uh, torn at what to talk about, but anyway, back to the why why we proclaim the evangel. <coughs> so first of all, we realize that we want people to have Eonian life. We want to see them at the snatching away. Now the other reason we proclaim the evangel is there's coming a time on this earth called the indignation, the coming indignation. On the way here, we are reading Scripture. Do you know the language Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians regarding those who obey not the evangel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know what words it uses for them? Extermination. Exterminated. Do you want to see anyone exterminated? Now notice it doesn't say eternal conscious torment. It says exterminated. How many of you want to see somebody exterminated? Beside Martin Zender. <laughs> so the answer is, how do you make it? How do you do everything in your power to make sure they're not exterminated? What's the solution? Lower taxes? Voting in Romney instead of Obama? What is the solution to bring somebody uh, for, out of extermination? And that's the evangel of grace. The evangel of the grace of God. And it's all concerning His Son. Romans chapter 1, Paul starts out, he says, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, a called apostle, severed for God's evangel concerning His Son. And the word concerning is a Greek word. It's, it's P-E-R-I when you spell it. Now, can you think of any words in English that have the word P-E-R-I? Think of one. Perimeter. What's a perimeter? Yeah, some of you draw a circle, right? And something's in the, it's a perimeter. So you think of a perimeter, and it, it encloses something. The gospel is concerning, all about, it's centered around His Son. The evangel of grace is not about your sin. 
The evangel of grace is not about you at all. The evangel of grace is about a person. It's about the person and work of Christ. And so, you spend all of your time... Somebody once said that if a good evangelist strikes a circle of three feet around the cross of Calvary and never lets anyone out of that circle. So our evangel is all about what Christ has accomplished. And you don't have to make an appeal. The more you proclaim it, the Spirit of God will find the heart, the one He has chosen, and they will, they will get it. They will get it. We don't have to do a whole lot of... Uh, 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 you don't have to be eloquent either. either. It doesn't require... Violence. It doesn't require someone with speaking abilities. It doesn't require somebody standing up on a pulpit with teeth wider than the noonday sun and a big globe circling behind them to be able to proclaim this message. It doesn't require any of that. Do you know what Paul said about his speaking ability? It doesn't require an evangelist to proclaim the evangel. Do you know that? Anyone can do it. Now, there are evangelists. We're not denying that. Listen to the Apostle Paul. He says, And I, coming to you, brethren came not with superiority of word or wisdom, announcing to you the testimony of God. For I decide not to perceive anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I came to be with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Doesn't sound like a very confident minister, does he? And my word and my heralding were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Paul had no need whatsoever for the philosophy of his day. He never confused Plato, Aristotle with Christ. Never confused him. Never equated them. He didn't need it. But with demonstration of spirit and of power. Now this had nothing to do with miracle signs and wonders. It had to do with the message itself. The message that Paul proclaimed bypassed all human wisdom. In chapter 1 he says the Jews request signs and the Greeks are seeking after wisdom. We are heralding Christ crucified. And it didn't take somebody that was skilled or gifted to do that. It just took somebody who knew Christ. Now, it doesn't mean you have to quit your jobs to do that. There are very few people who do that full time. But so when we think about our friends, you know, when it, when because you get the common uh, objections to this salvation of all message, we believe in the salvation of all. But that is way in the future. The burden of our message now is everything Paul taught us. The first thing we want to do is to see our friends and family become members of the body of Christ and not miss out on the eons. And the only way that happens is when they embrace the message that Christ died for our sins. And most of Christians doesn't believe that Christ even died, do they? Why? What teaching denies the death of Christ? The Trinity. What's that? The Trinity. The Trinity denies it. But here we're proclaiming that Jesus Christ is God's Son. And that He actually died. Romans 6 says that death had dominion over Him. And by the way, if eternal conscious torment is the wages of sin, Christ never paid it. Christ never paid it. Christ died for our sins. He was entombed. He was roused again the third day according to the Scriptures. You know what God says about that message? That it, it is the power of God. That word power is the word for ability. It's God's ability for salvation to him that believes. It's God's ability. So don't hang up any of your own power lines. All you can do is hinder it. He doesn't need your eloquence. He doesn't need your flower and language of any kind. You don't have to be especially gifted. It's a simple message. And that message carries with it all of God's saving power and will find the one that God has chosen for life eonian. So, the question again is, why preach the evangel if there is no eternal hell? What a silly question. First and foremost, if eternal conscious torment is the only reason for living, you've got a sad God. And I always ask the question this way, you believe in hell? Yes. Then why live for God if you're saved by grace after you're, not long, you're no longer going to hell? It's just, you turn it right around them. It's the same concept. They don't get it. They think that somehow without eternal conscious torment, there can't be a God. There can't be a good news. 
And it's really a sad situation. So we have lots of reasons to proclaim the evangel. And first and foremost is because we want to see them have Eonian life. We want to see them at the snatching away. We want to see them with a celestial allotment. Because without it, they're going to be exterminated. That's hard language, isn't it? It's hard language, but it's true. And God, everyone, and look at all the people we have here. And I just want to say something in passing. I was, uh, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Tommy. Tommy. You know why they call him that? The name. Because that's his name. <laughs> he was saying he's from North Carolina. How many of you are from North Carolina here? Do you all know each other? Just through, yeah, I mean, you've got groups getting together to encourage each other. And you know what a great evangelistic tool is? Get some of these small books by Zender, some of them by Clyde, and find the ones that you think that would be suitable to give to beginners. That's a great way to herald the evangel. That's a great way to do it and to bring someone into uh, the knowledge of Christ. And never think that you have to have all the answers. You do not. You do not have to have all the answers to be able to give this message out. But be diligent in your studies and uh, get to know him. And you will find that the, the more you learn and the more you bounce ideas off each other, study scripture together, and of course listen to the programs, read some of the material, you'll find that these messages will become easier and easier. You'll know the answers, but you don't have to know them all right away to start. All right, I'm, I'm stopping here and I'm going to see if there's, uh, I'd like to throw it open for questions and uh, comments. Yeah. JD and I were talking about this on the way up here, and I know Martin and I have talked about it, and Martin and I and JD. <coughs> And, and you're the one that kind of makes me ask this question. This gentleman was a Baptist preacher until three years ago? Oh, since 97. Mm -hmm. So you, you, he's been a believer in the right. Guys, so we've had this question about what constitutes the evangelist. Mm -hmm. So if this gentleman had never come into what we have, is he? Is he exterminated for the eons because he doesn't know what we know? Or is there some sort of baseline belief system that, that qualifies you for the eons? Uh, let me, uh, can I go a long way around the barn to answer your question? Absolutely. All right. Um, first of all, let me just say that ignorance is not a virtue. It's ignorance. Right? Ignorance is never a virtue. As a matter of fact, ignorance is deadly. <coughs> Paul says the Jews had a zeal of God, but not in accord with recognition. So one, ignorance is not a virtue, no matter how pretentious the person is. The answer to the question is, if somebody does not believe that Christ died for their sins, was entombed, aroused again the third day according to the Scriptures, they are not a believer. Despite the fact that they may not comprehend and understand what death really means, I would have to say yes, and that's why I believe the teaching of the Trinity is one of the most satanic doctrines. Any, any teaching that teaches death is life is one of the means by which he deceives. Let me, let me take this back to sure. myself. I was born and raised a seventh Adventist. Yes. As you know seventh Adventists don't believe in hell. Right. We believe in death, yay death. Yeah. We believe in the or I say we in the former sense of the word. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Yes. But yet the seventh Adventist religion is legalistic mm -hmm. and you must keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. That really is the most important thing in the Seventh Adventist religion. Mm -hmm. So had I not come into this, this where's my threshold there? Well, and I they, I can't read I can't and this is why I say this that if you believe that you you had the right information in the beginning you'll be led elsewhere and that's where you were led yeah you were led out of there because you had the right foundation um, sometimes I think a Jehovah Witness and a Seventh Day Adventist is a leg up on on modern Christendom uh, they have less baggage well I never had to get on and the best thing about a Seventh Day Adventist and a, uh, a Church of Christ, the guy who flew the planes around, uh, they didn't believe in God. Worldwide Church of God. Worldwide Church of God people. The reason why they're good candidates is because they've been so screwed over by trying to keep the law, they know better. So they're good candidates because they had a good biblical background. And grace is an odd, and we know a lot of ex, I think our, the whole group in Amarillo, Texas that Mark and I have been to, and Clyde is 
a lot of them are ex Worldwide Church of God That's people me. that just got here. There's one right Four there. Four years ago. Four years ago. See, there you go. So they're better candidates. The Forty, it, 40 years ago. So those of us who are considered the biggest heretics by mainline Christianity are the best candidates for grace. Isn't that amazing? Uh, so but regarding the threshold, I don't know how to explain it except to say that our job, we have a teaching evangel. It's an evangel that requires patience, time, and it, let's face it, this is just the heat Greek scriptures. If God wanted to make it easier, he would have given us a lot smaller book with bullet points. But he didn't. He didn't give us bullet points, and that's why uh, Paul calls the, the 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 man of God a workman. This is not this is not an easy job. This is not for those people who want bullet points and uh, you know things like that. So it is, it requires time and patience. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, Jeff. Yes. I, I'm just looking around the room. And I see a lot of male faces. The young men were just asking where all the women were at, I know. Yeah, what the heck? <laughs> From you and, and, and Martin and, and Clyde and I. Is that typical of, of girls? No. No. I haven't seen this many men since football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for that information. Yeah, yeah. There's hope, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an encouraging thing to see the man interested. It is, yeah. Because yeah. I, mean, I think that's the way it's supposed to be. The men are the teachers of life. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking, I was talking about this with Cherie. Why do you think women take the lead in mainline churches? Is that not, no, no. You don't think so? No. And I, I may offend the ladies, so like forgive me by saying it, because women are emotional. Women think that way, and church appeals. Because you go in, you got the pews, you got the music, you got the appearance of security. And that appeals to the ladies more than the men. And that's why they take the lead in the mainline uh, denominations, because they want to have the form. They want to have what's appealing. That's why in, you can ask Clyde Martin, you know how many brethren we deal with that are no longer with us because of their wives? Because they all want the church situation. They don't want this because they're, let's face it, where's the pretty music here? Where's the guy with the white teeth and the globe behind us? That's appealing to the senses. That's appealing, that's appealing to the soulish sensations. Now, there's nothing wrong with soul, but in this situation, it's misleading. That's why they, they have to have they have to have the, the forms. They have to have what what looks like a systematic uh, thing for, for the appeal. And I think that's why you have most of them leading in that situation. I think that goes back to being advocating it because if, I mean, if in fact the, it was the man's role to make sure the responsibility of his family was to learn the gospel, yeah, they would not leave simply based on white wanting. To go to you know this it's no it would be this is my responsibility I do this. I think I think the men have just kind of given up. I think they just well it's easier on me just to go in give in whatever somebody wants or whatever. Yeah. You know you're not you're not you're not keeping up that responsibility. Yeah why pay money to sit and watch entertainment on Sunday when you can do it at a movie theater on Friday night? Cheaper. Yeah it's cheaper. Yeah you were saying and, that, and, and Paul's evangel that the price is and they can suffer for I wrote an article, I, won't, I didn't write, excuse me, I edited an article by A.E. Knock. If you go to SheridanVoice.com, it, it's called Paul the Pessimist. And if you get a chance to read, it was written by Knock, it was an unsearchable riches volume two, I believe. And I found this article, and when I read it, my jaw dropped. I had read it a couple years ago, Martin, I think you showed it to me. It didn't hit me at the time until it really hit me what our pathway is in this world as believers in this message. So uh, get a chance, go read that article by Knock. It'll, it'll read it twice. Read it, to, read it once and come back and read it again the next day. You have to read this article. So, Alan, I'd like to hear Alan's perspective on that yes. regarding the women in your church because 
As far as I know, you're, you've got the biggest church of believers yeah. I've ever heard of. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right. That's the Concord Mega Church guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's a lot of people. How many people left when you started the claim? Well, the congregation, I left the church. Oh. I was part of a oh, church. Okay. This is a new congregation. All right. Yeah. You've got going on. So you've got 60 people in your congregation? Yes, sir. You're that's right. a mega mega church. Mega church. <laughs> that's that's bus, mega, though. mega, mega. You need a guitar player? <laughs> yes. What am I doing here? We have the Joel Osteen and the Concordia. <laughs> <laughs> All you need is his teeth. Are you looking at his teeth? Look at his teeth. Look at his teeth. Do you have a globe? Do you have a globe? <laughs> Do you have a globe? Your yeah, best life now. <laughs> I wonder about the number of women in your congregation. It, it outweighs the Tony's women. Tony's looking this way. They're, they're, they're oh, not only women, but they're good looking women. That's right. <laughs> I was just there two weeks ago. Now they, don't all, they don't all leave when you say it's a time for children's church, do they? No, no, they don't all leave. But It was kind of that way in the Baptist church, though. Whenever I was part of the Baptist church, the women outweighed the men, and the women did everything around there. Yeah. But then they were to keep quiet when it comes to business decisions, yeah, which usually ticked some of them off. You know, it's always been that way. But I, to be honest with you, I think our little church was kind of balanced. Mm -hmm. What'd you think? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was sort of balanced with men and women. And uh, but why? I have no idea. Why? I have no idea. I used to be a pastor. Did you? Yeah. Well, doesn't Genesis speak and God told Eve that it would be natural for her to want to rule over her husband? Isn't that? No. You never... I think it's a misinterpretation of the verse. It may be. I mean, it may be. I think it, uh, this was no. something that me and actually Waylon and I discussed. <clears throat> I'll read to you what the concordant version of the marginal notes. Do you know another what style. scripture I'm speaking yeah. of then? Yeah, I well, do. Paul, okay. Paul said, I do not want you to be domineering over a man. Yeah. And maybe that's a verse, too. Well, that I, I think that speaks to the tendency. Right. I think that might speak toward the tendency of that okay. uh, yeah. in 1 Corinthians. But this Dan's going to read something from Genesis. In, in Genesis yeah, 3, the, the, uh, in a, I the idea of the, the man ruling over, I think they translate that way because some people in the King James Committee have problems with their wives. Um, do you know nowhere in the scriptures ever say a woman to obey her husband? Children obey, but women never obey. It's, it's submission. That's the word used. It's uh, it's never says obey. You're not you're not children. Um, Verse sixteen. And uh, Genesis three. Uh, Genesis three. Sixteen. Yeah. <clears throat> And it says, and to the woman, he says, multiplying ye, multiplying am I your grief and the groaning of your pregnancy, and grief shall you bear sons. Yet, to your husband is your impulse, and he shall rule in you. That verse in this next chapter talks about the sheep coming to uh, Cain. The idea of this verse is that the, the, the woman's impulse is toward her husband. Women, are they have more of a desire for their husbands. And he shall rule in you. That means in her heart that she is all about her, her husband. I found that to be true in just about every relationship. She is she's about her, her marriage and her relationship to her husband. Was that part of the curse? No, I don't think it was part of the curse. Um, uh, and I don't think that was a curse. No, I'm saying that, that part there was, was having to do with after their sin. Yeah, well, the curse was the, the pain in childbirth. Okay. That's what I what I think the, the curse is. So, um, But that's all the information. I'm 29 minutes and 58 seconds, so we'll leave it there. <laughs>